What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE Fantasy Football. Welcome to a brand new piece of content for the big dogs lineup. I'm going to do this every single Monday. Q&A Monday. 32 A's in Monday. Monday! I'd like to preface by saying I apologize for any clickbait that you get up front, but I promise at one point or another we will tackle the topic that is in the thumbnail. This is going to be a fun piece of content to do going forward because most of the videos we do tackle a very specific topic. It's either mock draft or running back rankings or whatever, whatever. I'm going to take a wide variety of questions from you guys every single Monday and answer them to the best of my damn ability. Some of them are going to be fantasy related, trade targets, dynasty, redraft, rankings, margarita related, whatever, whatever, whatever you guys want i will pick my favorite questions and answer them every single monday how do you get your question answered fantastic question that will be the first question that i tackle right now one of two ways one if you're a patreon member i will make a post every single week asking you guys for your questions and you simply reply to that in the thread number two if you join us on discord if you're not already a member of the discord channel which is like 1500 people deep we got 30 dynasty startup leagues already going on with the big dog subscribers which is fucking incredible i love each and every one of you guys for joining discord channel will be linked down below in discord you can just DM me your question. If I like it, it will get featured. So Patreon, comment on the thread, Discord, sign up, go DM me your question, and maybe I'll get around to it. So just feel free to throw those out throughout the week. Welcome to BDGE's very first Q&A Monday. Tuck your shirt in, stop yelling, hit the intro. Yeah, I'm actually the worst. I'm sorry for that ridiculous intro. All right, first question comes in from Hugo Ramirez, Patreon member. Thank you for the support, Hugo. Who's, aside from A.J. Brown, the second-year wide receiver to own for redraft? Answer, simple. For me, it's it's Terry McLaurin, a thousand percent. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of, this was a very good wide receiver class. There are a lot of sophomore wide receivers that are tempting to draft. And actually I would suggest taking them at their typical ADP value, right? You have the Debo Samuels, you have the DK Metcalfs. They're not guys I'm avoiding by any means. And I will probably own them on some of my teams. But I think right now, Terry is arguably one of, if not the most or the, the, the single best value in fantasy football drafts. Right now, Terry is going off the board 67th overall as the wide receiver 28. That's at the 608 in 12-man leagues, which is unbelievable. If you told me right now that I can accept this offer, that come September, when I have all my redraft leagues, if I can get Terry at the 608 in every one of my drafts, I would smash accept right now. Without even knowing who else was going to be left on the board, I would take Terry at the 608 1,000 out of 10 times. Every single time, I'm smashing Terry at the 608. You look back at last year, his rookie season, he played in 14 games. He put up a 93 for 58 line, 93 targets, 58 receptions, 919 yards, seven touchdowns, expanding that out to a full 16, right? He misses two games last year, but if he plays the full 16, you're looking at full rookie year numbers of 106 targets, 66 catches, 1,050 receiving yards. We know that's a very elusive mark for rookie wide receivers and eight touchdowns. Again, as a rookie, and he was eviscerating some of the top cornerbacks on the way. He went against Stephen Gilmore. He went against Byron Jones, and he was making them look silly on tape at times. I know a lot of people are hesitant to buy Terry, and I understand why because he was a relatively unknown guy coming into the league he did not get a lot of media hype and then all of a sudden he gets picked in the third round he goes to the Redskins and the quarterback situation is kind of in flux so it's very hard to buy into the whole Terry thing right he didn't produce much at Ohio State and then you look at his player profile and you kind of see this this ridiculous speed 435 and you say eh, he's a one-trick pony strictly a deep ball and we remember him multiple times last year going down the field and scoring 65 70 yard touchdowns so that's what sticks out in the back of your mind to me my comp for him is Rob Robert Woods with 435 speed. Robert Woods with Mike Wallace esque speed. He's an excellent route runner. He can beat press and man coverage. We saw that all last year. He's not built like Deshaun Jackson either. You might make the comparison because of the way that they played last year and the production where a lot of Terry's production came from. You have to understand, Terry has not only two inches on Deshaun Jackson, but he has over 30 pounds on Deshaun Jackson. Terry is not a small dude by any means. Six foot, 208 pounds. You want to talk about being a possession receiver, right? The reason that I labeled him as like a Robert Woods type player is because he could run good routes and he could be a possession receiver last year among all nfl wide receivers terry mclaurin posted the single highest contested catch rate at 68.4 percent the single highest among any nfl wide receiver not just rookies there wasn't a single game in which he played fewer than 86 percent of the skin snaps and you look at what they did this offseason it was absolutely nothing jordan reed is dead there were rumors that you know maybe the redskins take a wide receiver early in the draft that didn't happen they they waited until the fourth round to take antonio gandy golden that tells you that they're extremely comfortable with terry mclaurin being the alpha there the 
real questions about Sari have nothing to do with his talent. And if you're off him from a talent standpoint, you're doing fantasy football wrong. It obviously has everything to do with Dwayne Haskins at quarterback. So let's take a look at the numbers from last year. Playing with Dwayne Haskins and without Dwayne Haskins. On the left side is, is in the games where Dwayne Haskins actually played. Right off the rip, you'll see that he scored fewer fantasy points. But when you actually look at the quantity in terms of like his involvement, McLaurin averaged more targets averaged more receptions and averaged a higher yards per game number with Haskins on the field. I know it was a very small jump in terms of most of those categories, but nonetheless, it was good to see that it was there or it was higher in all those categories, which should come as no surprise considering the two played at Ohio State together, which is a sneaky thing to remember. So the question becomes, will Dwayne Haskins take the next jump? I mean, he fucking better. Overall, you look at McLaurin last year with Haskins, with Case Keenum under center, his accuracy rating, target accuracy rating per player profile was 85th among wide receivers and he's still bald. I'm of the belief that when you look at Haskins, it's way too early to label him a bust. He was thrown into an awful situation, little time to prepare for it. They added almost nothing outside uh, to compete with Terry this year. Yes, they added Antonio Gibson, who's going to be like a slot running back. They have no one else that's going to catch passes outside. I mean, Kelvin Harmon's going to be fine, whatever. What it tells me is that his target share in this offense is going to be massive. So even if he has a dip in efficiency, the volume will more than make up for it. So you're getting like a true possession number one wide receiver and a real alpha on an NFL team that has 4-3-5 speed with that 70-yard touchdown week-to-week -week upside. He did that multiple times last year as a rookie. He had a 23% target share, which isn't small by any means. It was that his target share on the Redskins last year was above Chris Godwin's target share, was above Tyreek Hill's target share, et cetera, et cetera, some other really good names. So he's going to see, without a doubt, a big boost in the target share this year, coming into his second year, entrenched as the number one, entrenched as the alpha. So I don't understand how you could be worried about him being the number one and getting the, the you know, getting the coverage from the opposite cornerback ones because he was already doing that last year. He came into the league as like a 98% snap player. He was basically the alpha from the rip and showed you that he was more than capable of, of beating these top cornerbacks. So drafting Terry at the 608 as a wide receiver 27 28 right now is his absolute floor in my opinion but you're getting like top 12 to 15 upside in this receiver so to have a guy who could take one 70 yards for a touchdown as your wide receiver three is fucking beautiful all right so Hugo actually gets a two-part question second question who's the wide receiver two in Green Bay for redraft so I think this in itself is basically a two-part question so we're going to take the second part of his question and break it down to another part Big parts guy over here. The first question you ask, who is the wide receiver two in Green Bay for redraft? The second question I think we need to realistically ask is does it fucking matter for fantasy football? So last year we're looking at Marquez Valdez Scantling, right? MVS and Geronimo Allison had every opportunity to gain control of that wide receiver two spot in Green Bay. Neither of them came even close to doing it. Allison is now in Detroit. MVS, you know, if he couldn't do it last year with every opportunity to do so, there's absolutely no, no reason to believe in him doing it this year. Who else do they have there? I mean, realistically, they signed Devin Funches. It was a one-year, $2.5 million deal with some incentives. He missed all of last year with a, with a collarbone while he was on the Indianapolis Colts. I think it is worth noting, though, that Devin Funches, who seemingly has been in the NFL for like 45 years, is still relatively young. I mean, he just turned 26. So, I do think that Funches has the ability to extend his career beyond what we're looking at him as now, right? It seems like if he was out of the league by next year, no one would be surprised, but it also wouldn't be surprising to me if he played another three or four years as a role player. And that's where I see him playing his part as a role player for the Packers, like someone that you can use in tight situations, contested catch situations, like down near the red zone, big body guy. I don't think there's any chance we see like a hundred target season out of anyone not named Devontae Adams really in Green Bay. So that leads me to Alan Lazard as the possible second wide receiver in Green Bay. Now, Lazard checks just about every box you want to see out of a prospect outside of the undrafted capital. He was an undrafted free agent, stellar athlete, alpha frame, like absolutely elite, college dominator, breakout age, target chair. They were all there from his college days at Iowa State, did it in a Power 5 conference. And most importantly is the fact that like, everybody on this team, in this organization in Green Bay fucking loves this dude, Alan Lazard, Aaron Rodgers, Matt LaFleur. Like, they can't stop talking about him. However, I'm not about to put myself out on a limb here for for fucking Alan Lazard. He gets signed to a one-year $600,000 contract. Let me remind you, that is four times less than what Devin Funches got. That type of money is like, you better ball the fuck out this preseason or you're getting cut type of money. So if we look back to at what Lazard did last year, like what's the reason we're getting hyped about this guy? He was a near 65 to 75-ish percent snap guy starting in about week six. So after Devontae Adams left with his injury last year and he had his spurts, right? He, he showed kind of an in, inconsistent week to week ceiling. He had individual games of four for 65 and a touchdown against Detroit, three for 103 and a touchdown against New York. I got it up here and four for 69 and a touchdown in the regular season finale 
also against Detroit. So outside of those three games, though, he was extremely, extremely mediocre. And let's not pretend that matchups against Detroit and New York Giants are anything better than matchups against awful, awful pass defenses last year. So while you kind of like the upside of Lazard, and he very well could end up being the wide receiver two year, like he could be the wide receiver with the second most targets, receptions, and yards, doesn't mean he's going to be a good fantasy player. I mean, the Packers under the floor are a very, very, very much run first offense. Devontae Adams is going to get his 30% of the team's targets, which wipes out a lot of targets there. The running backs are going to combine between Jones and Jamal Williams if they use A.J. Dillon for like another 20 to 25% of the targets. And then you spread out the rest of the targets between Jay Sturm, Burger, Alan Lazar, Devin Funches, MVS, and, and the upside is just not really there for anyone not named Devontae Adams. This isn't this isn't the years of 2013, 2014, 2015, where no matter who was the wide receiver two for Aaron Rodgers, he's going to eat because this offense is not the same. They're not passing at a Mike McCarthy rate of 65 to 70%. They go heavy on the ground, and whoever is the wide receiver two doesn't necessarily eat behind Aaron Rodgers, who is not at his elite level of passing anymore. If I'm choosing someone, it's definitely going to be Alan Lazard, but I think he'll probably be touted as a more popular breakout sleeper pick than he actually should be in fantasy this year. So Hugo, I hope that answers uh, your questions. Let's move on to the biggest Cleveland Browns fan I know, and that is Mr. Georgie K. Mr. Georgie, he asks, Dalvin Cook or Zeke in Dynasty? Straight up, so... You know, after seeing the question, my initial reaction was one player, but I wanted to make sure I did a little bit more research. And I actually changed my answer and I've changed my outlook on my dynasty running back rankings, uh, at least at the top, the top elite guys. What's crazy, what's crazy, and you probably already heard this from me if you follow me on Twitter. If you're not following me on Twitter, it's linked somewhere up there at Nick underscore BDGE. You assume that Dalvin Cook probably has a lot more fantasy years, more relevant fantasy years left than, than Zeke does in the tank. And why do we assume that? Because Cook is younger than Zeke, right? That's not even true. He's 18 days younger than Zeke is, which was shocking to me when I looked this up. I could have sworn that Cook was like 24 and Zeke was maybe 26 and a half or something. So they both turned 25 this summer. So why Zeke over Dalvin Cook? I get the argument that Dalvin Cook is a more electric runner. He's better in the passing game, whatever. But when you look at things that matter for Dynasty, you have these guys for a long time. So you want to make sure that they're durable. Zeke has shown elite durability given the workload that he's gotten. Yes, he has some off the field issues. But if you're trying to argue that Zeke's off the field issues are more of a concern than Dalvin Cook's on the field injury issues, you're going to lose that argument 11 out of 10 times. So durability easily with Zeke, not with Dalvin Cook. One of them already has that elusive second year running back contract in place. Not to mention it was fucking record breaking, ink breaking, ink probably fucking spilled through the paper. And to clean it up, Zeke probably used some of the damn money that he got from the contract. So you look at one guy who already has that second contract for running back, which is very hard to get, especially as a workhorse. Like a lot of running backs get contracts, but not ones that are significant enough to guarantee them a huge role in whatever offense they're getting. So Zeke has a contract, Dalvin Cook does not. When you look at Zeke's contract, I mean, he has signed without a doubt through 2022. They could take a dead cap hit of almost $11 million in 2022, but there's no shot that's happening. Even in 2023, they're taking an almost $7 million cap hit. They do save $8 million by doing it, but like, are you just going to release Zeke when he's 28 years old? Like, That's still a relevant years left in Zeke's contract all the way through 2023. So that's four more years, and we don't even know if Dalvin Cook's going to get that contract. Both are in very good offenses as well, but I'd argue the Cowboys are almost in elite status. When you look, they were number one in the NFL last year in terms of yards per game and now they add uh cd lamb to their offense like i don't i don't know what to tell you i don't know if they'll ever be as potent as like the chiefs or the ravens offense but they are arguably one of the highest floor offenses in the nfl now the vikings are fine as an offense they're, it's definitely not a negative for cook but they're not up to the status of where the cowboys are and i know you know there are there are more here's a, I, I i when i tweeted this out so many people were like one of them's in a run heavy offense like okay that's a cool argument except you want to bet money that zeke gets more rushing attempts than dalvin cook because i would bet you a million dollars that's what happened you could say oh they're they're a more run heavy offense but that doesn't matter if they're not getting as many rush attempts if dalvin cook's not going to have more rush attempts than zeke then what does it matter you making the argument that they're a run heavier team so it's as simple as that for me because age is not a factor given the fact that they're exactly the same age. One has that second contract. One does not. One's about to be in an elite offense for the next few years. They will sign Dak Prescott to a long-term contract. And yes, overall, I'll admit, maybe Dalvin Cook's ceiling is a little bit higher, but Zeke's ceiling also has like 16 to 18 touchdowns on a yearly basis in that range of outcomes. So you could say something dumb like Zeke has all this tread on his tires, but how are you going to use that as a negative when he is shown to stay healthy through all of that workload, when Dalvin Cook, who has less tread on his tires, can't stay healthy 
while having less tread. I, I think it's pretty easily Zeke in this situation. I hope that answers your question, Uncle Georgie. Let's move on to question numero three. Nick Huss from Patreon. Thank you for the support, Nicholas. Been listening to Mike and Noah Harp on how beneficial it is to trade down in Dynasty startups. Do you think the same applies for redraft leagues or is it better to secure your stud in the first? No, definitely, definitely not. You do that and you trade back in Dynasty because you need depth. This is a long-term play. The rosters are very, very, very large and you're in it for the long haul. So your top tier picks in redraft are, are as important as anything. You could legitimately win your redraft league with like three elite players and very, very little besides that. And yes, you could do that for one year in Dynasty, but if your team is made up of elite players in Dynasty, at the very beginning at least, it's probably because you sold on the youth, you sold on future rookie picks and all that shit, and you're, you're going to be in the shitter for the long term. The starting lineup in redraft is massively important. The waiver wire always has depth on it. That's, that's the big takeaway here is you don't do that because because you can always replenish via the waiver wire in redraft. Whereas in Dynasty, if you can get a guy off the waiver wire in Dynasty that even makes one start for you on the year, you're ecstatic with that waiver wire pickup. That's not the case for redraft, obviously. You could literally pick up a starting wide receiver, starting NFL wide receiver. Yeah, they might not be the alpha, but like a low end wide receiver two or high end wide receiver three off the waiver wire any given week. If a running back gets hurt in redraft, then their backup who is now a starting NFL running back is on the wire. Whereas in Dynasty, the backup is, is already owned. The backup's backup is already owned. So depth is way, way way more important than dynasty and the starting lineup in redraft is uh extremely underrated so no do not trade back in redraft if anything trading up is okay question four it's kind of a a, a double it's two different questions for different people but i think we can kind of answer them together one is from daniel he says what is the best way to introduce and convince a 12 team full ppr redraft league to change to super flex I love this question. I get it all the time. And I don't think I've actually ever given a real strong answer to it. And I'm going to answer this as seriously as I possibly can right now. When you're in a fantasy football league, especially one you want to take seriously, you have to treat it as if you're in politics. You want to change? You want to change in policy? You have to politic your way into that shit. So first thing you want to understand is what does it take in order to change a rule? Like for instance, the the league that me, Snacks, and, and Animal are in, the E-Town Get Down, we have a league meeting every summer where we do a vote if we wanna change something. If we wanna change a league rule, we have to get a majority of the vote to vote on the change. So we have 10 people in the league. If we get six votes for something, then we will change it. Unless it's something uh, revolving around money, like the buy-in price or something, anything money-related needs to be unanimous. But for anything else, majority vote wins. If it's five out of 10, then it stays the same. So you got to figure out what it takes to change it and then reverse engineer that shit. If I wanted to change a rule, I would have to convince five other people within the E-Town Get Down that the rule is beneficial for them. It's like you see in any of like the, the TV shows that are based in the White House. You know, someone wants to change something. You got to start plotting. You got to start scheming. It's like, oh, you know, we need three votes from their side. Otherwise, we'll never get the bill passed. Fucking Jerry loves the Knicks. Let's get him courtside seats for next Tuesday's game. Fucking Sheila hasn't made love in two weeks. Let me get make her give me a blow job and she'll give me a vote reverse engineer each person what i would do is go about this privately don't post it in the group chat whether you're using group me or whatsapp or text message do not throw it out there into the group chat here's the reason why the majority of people in the world are followers so even if like seven people quietly like the rule change as soon as one or two or three people start yelling in the group chat about why it's a bad idea the people, because they're naturally followers, don't want to go against the grain. And it's much harder to convince the whole together. So for this specific situation where you want to change things to a super flex draft, you target the people that take fantasy football the most serious first. You start talking to them. You ask them, you know, like, what are your thoughts on playing with two quarterbacks or super flex, right? Get them kind of in the zone of talking about it first. And then you start making points like this, like quarterbacks are the most valuable position in real football. It's kind of stupid that we play fantasy football where it makes them completely irrelevant. And super flex is a way of making them valuable and relevant again in fantasy football, which since they are the most important position in real football, that should be the case in fantasy. And the reason you go to people that take fantasy football seriously first is because you could tell them that super flex makes it more difficult, not for them, but for the people that aren't prepared going into the draft. The people who know more football, this, you're basically patronizing them in a way. People who know more football and do more research about fantasy are going to be in a better position to win the league because the bigger the roster, the more starting spots, the more each person has to know in order to draft a good team. And that's the same for quarterbacks and super flex because right now, if you're drafting in a one quarterback league, you don't need to know anything about quarterbacks. You could just say, I'll fade quarterbacks until round 10 and then 
pick up two or three guys that are quarterback twos or whatever and one of them will be playing a good opponent each week tell them that using in a second quarterback or using the super flex option makes the league better because people are going to have to do more research and the people that are really into football really into fantasy football will see this as an opportunity to leapfrog all the people that get lucky or don't do as much research so cater to the people that really like fantasy and lastly once you kind of get some of the group behind it, you tell them that it makes the league more engaging and more exciting because it does, because it gives you more trade possibilities, right? You see a lot of trades done in super flex leagues because it opens up more than just the running backs and the wide receivers mattering, right? It makes the waiver wire more fun. But if, if you have a, a running back that gets injured, right? And you're playing in a one quarterback league, you're kind of fucked because the quarterback doesn't matter to begin with. But if you're playing in a super flex league, your running back gets injured. Maybe you had that extra quarterback where that matters in trading. So now you could still trade for a running back after a running back got hurt. Just, the trade market in general is just way bigger and more fun when you're in super flex. So tell, tell your dumb ass friend, that too it's all about reverse engineering this shit i'm serious it is really about politics out here bro we might even fuck around and run for president in 2020 20 30 2020 2020 when the fuck are the presidential debates whenever the fuck it is we running all right part two saucy peen for thursday's q a how do you convince your league mates that qbs matter in super flex because in our league everyone just draft like it's one quarterback even though it's super flex you convince them that QBs matter in Superflex by beating their fucking ass. Because if they're acting like it doesn't matter, all of that quarterback value falls right to your lap. The problem with this strategy is if you have a very small league, quarterbacks, even in Superflex, matter a little bit less. I'm going to assume that maybe you're in an 8 or 10 team league. If that's the case, then quarterbacks do take a little bit of a backseat. If you're in a 12 team league, then you'll know if you've played in Superflex leagues that quarterbacks are extremely important. You can't force them to like something because you want them to draft quarterbacks early so that you get better value in running backs wide receiver. The only thing you could do is use that to your advantage. Listen, if you can get Mahomes in the first, Lamar Jackson in the second, Dak in the third, Kyler in the fourth, Russ in the fifth, fucking do it because then the people who are looking for quarterbacks are going to be fucked they're going to be coming for you every year there are quarterbacks who bust every year there are quarterbacks who get hurt and what happens when that happens you own all of them and you got them at incredible value so what you're going to be able to do is take that fifth round russell wilson and flip them for a first or second round running back so the way you do it is not by convincing them but by showing them right actions speak louder than words my friend so saucy peen keep that fucking peen in your pants keep the quarterbacks on your roster trade them when you need to just beat their ass with super flex and they will be convinced all right question five we got two more we got one fantasy question one bonus lifestyle question before i get into it though if you are enjoying the video a thumbs up button would be very much appreciated or just let me know how you guys like the q a style of of videos because i feel like this will be one of my best style of videos going forward because i get to touch on a lot of you know a wide variety of topics that i don't normally get to and uh it kind of helps out anybody in in all types of leagues so let me know in the comment section what you guys think of the q a and if i should continue to do them every monday maybe do them bi-weekly or some shit question five noah's bunk bed question for the q a first time playing dynasty and i went young do you think drafting a bunch of rookies is a good strategy for context i have ceh judy lamb rugs higgins van jefferson plus many more late round rookie flyers so the question is basically do you target mainly rookies in a startup draft it's obviously going to come down to a lot of context. Like, I like the players that you draft at all. Like, C.H., Judy, Lamb, Ruggs, Higgins are definitely ones that I am okay investing in. It's going to come down to where you got them, where they values in the draft. I wouldn't say, like, outright you go in, you should go into a startup saying, like, I'm going to target rookies. Take a lot of the context that you should be using out of it when you just do that. Because here's the thing. When you're drafting in your dynasty startup, a lot of the time you don't even realize the age. Like, what, what's the advantage of taking a rookie? You want to take a rookie because they're younger. They'll hopefully last longer on your team. The problem with that is when you look at some of these guys, now I don't know off the top of my head all these guys' ages, but if you do it that way because they're young, you're going to end up taking rookies that are older than sophomores, and that kind of defeats the purpose of it. The other thing about rookies is we have nothing going on for like three or four months leading into the NFL draft, so we all get really hyped about all these rookie players, thus their buzz and their hype gets perpetuated up the ADPs of the draft boards of the startup dynasty thing. So everyone gets super excited. And before you know, these guys start creeping up, creeping up, creeping up, losing all of their value in startup drafts because it's the only names we've been hearing for so long. We start getting excited about them. The sophomores are the ones that start getting pulled back a little bit. And I think those are the better values. So drafting young, yes, obviously a very good idea to do so in dynasty for the longevity of your team. I would say just mixing it up between young players, old players. I do say when you're starting, I think a good strategy 
is to start your draft on the younger side. It gives you more flexibility with the older guys later, and the older guys tend to fall later into the dynasty startups. But if you draft a lot of old guys first, you give yourself a lot less flexibility because you kind of put yourself into a win now mode, right? And if a young player who you like isn't necessarily going to produce in year one or year two, and you're going to have to wait on them, they're not a good fit with the older guys that you just drafted early on. So the earlier on, you need to pick safer, younger players to build the foundation of your dynasty team. Doesn't have to be rookies. I think drafting rookies is fine. Obviously, understanding that wide receivers take longer to produce. Tight ends take very long to produce. Running backs. The one thing I would say is running backs are definitely good investments if they're rookies because you tend to get like a round or two discount on them because they're not proven. But rookies tend to come in and start playing immediately on their rookie contracts when they are running backs. So I think drafting rookie running backs is a good strategy. It just comes down to like rankings. And if you personally like a player or not, draft them at value. Otherwise, I don't think there's an advantage to going straight rookie. Last question, bonus lifestyle question, Nick Haas. He's bike. Thoughts on the White Claw Variety Pack 2? Personally, I think the Lemon Tangerine might be the best two yet. I just got, I just went for a nice walk. That's why I'm looking all stylish and shit. And on that walk, I stopped into CVS and I just picked up a pack of the new White Claw Variety. I hadn't seen them yet before you asked this question. And I'm fucking stoked that they had them in. So we're going to do a live taste test right now. I've had the mango already. Haven't had tangerine. Haven't tried watermelon. Haven't tried lemon. Up to this point, mango has been my favorite flavor. I didn't even know mango was in the new variety pack. I thought it had been an older one already. So we're going to go down the list. We're going to start off with tangerine which you put some high praise on it. Ooh, that's pretty good. It kind of tastes like, it kind of tastes like diet orange soda, like a little bit of a flat orange soda, but that comes with the territory of being alcohol. Big fan of the tangerine. I like mango better. We'll, we'll kind of put the scale, the rating test up to, up to mango as the, as the top guy. We'll go watermelon next. I got such a sweet palate. Like I love sweet things sweet tooth like fruity shit sugar the more the better i love splenda like this could use more splenda watermelon is good very fruity i don't think i'd be able to drink like more than one of those though if i want a white claw like mango i could pound probably 14 of these in a row lemon i'm excited for lemon i feel like this is gonna be good this is the real like summertime super refreshing on a rooftop <clears throat> with nobody else because we're not allowed to be around a lot of people and i pretend i'm in a fucking corona commercial Oh yeah, this is the, couldn't be more spot on Nick. Lemon's fucking elite. Holy shit, I'm gonna drink this whole thing right now. Yep, I fully endorse Lemon White Claw. Ranking wise, I'd go Lemon, Mango, and then Tangerine and Watermelon are like out of the next tier. They're like the fucking Derrick Henry's of the top tier. C-Mac, Saquon, and then like fucking, it's like Derrick Henry and Josh Jacobs. Still good. You want them on your team, but you'd rather have these two. So that's what I think about them. They're pretty fucking good. I would definitely highly suggest. I like this variety pack far more than I like the original White Claw variety pack. Okay, okay. I'm done for today's Q&A. Thumbs up if you hated this video. That might actually work if I say thumbs up if you hated the video. Because I think we get way more thumbs up that way. And then a lot less thumbs down. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We're doing everything fantasy football forever and ever and ever until we pass away. If you haven't signed up to the weekly Big Dogs newsletter, we just launched actually the very first copy. You could, you could, this could go down in fucking history. You can remember where you were when the very first Big Dogs weekly newsletter went out. Handwritten by us. Sent out electronically. So we're going to handwrite it. We're going to fucking fax it and post it to you. If you head over to BigDogsFantasy.com, which is where our, our blog and our, our merch store is, you'll see a pop-up on the top that pops down and it lets you put your email in to get the newsletter. It's going to be fucking awesome. I'm really excited. The first issue went out today, but they will be coming out every single Monday to your inbox, letting you know what's going on behind the scenes with the brand, best things we've seen on Twitter, best content that we've personally consumed as the Big Dogs team, and maybe we'll send you some more recommendations. I also got... They fucking got me, bro. I was only going to do White Claw. And then I saw this thing, and I'm like, ah, eh, it looks like every other fucking stupid seltzer that's out there. Bud Light. Bud Light seltzer is so trash, by the way. It's called Cape Line. And where they got me is they had the margarita right in the middle right here. And I was like, I'm not, uh, I was like, tried to walk away. I was like, and then I had like a look back moment and I saw the margarita and I was like, ah, fuck it. All right, we're going to get it. So I'll save one of these margaritas for next week's Q&A. We'll do a little taste test review on that. I love y'all. I'm out. BigDogsFantasy.com for the newsletter.